my thoughts in terms of invasive species, as soon as you hear uh, of the concept um, of dealing with invasive species, uh, you can, I, I think it sort of speaks to social licence challenge. So today, invasive species sit alongside climate change, habitat loss, as one of the top three threats to Australia's native flora and fauna. Uh, in fact, estimates of the management, control and total economic losses of invasive species is $13.6 billion. So it's a huge problem and not one that the average Australian currently understands much about. So despite this uh, a clear and urgent need, the desire to have control measures or to uh, deal with the problems and the conflicts associated with the problems have not been managed in a way that, if you like, over time has built a social licence to operate for uh, this task. And we only have to look at um, the cane toad uh, <laughs> Um, as an example, I mean, it's really a terrible thing when you've got an important topic that you need to address and the, you know, the symbol of the problems created in the past is jumping around and spreading all over Australia. Uh, and therefore, it really just can't be ignored. Uh, and the issue of whether science can be trusted uh, to come up with the solutions is not something that the public has misconstrued. It's not like they haven't really understood because science did tell us that these solutions were appropriate solutions. And therefore, when it comes to the outrage associated with our solutions, um, there is a genuine credibility question. And so what I'd like to do is talk about how you can think about species management, particularly invasive species, and do that beyond just a community engagement mechanism, beyond what we would call a traditional communications approach, and uh, talk about how you could do it um, effectively in order to stem those losses and protect our flora and fauna. So the first concept is um, that we need to move from dad to Dave. Uh, you might remember that um, television show, which is why I inspired me to come up with this concept. But dad was the traditional approach, decide, announce, and defend. This is, we're scientists, we're experts, we know there's a problem, we're going to come up with a solution, it's a fantastic solution, and then we're going to prepare all of our media and comms to defend the action. And Dave is a different approach. It actually says, hang on, when it comes to issues where there's conflicted uh, views, then what we actually need to know is the dilemmas related to, A, the problem, and get an alignment around that problem solution uh, nexus. And by declaring those dilemmas and understanding them from multiple points of view, we can create a platform that is the certain platform upon which you can then acknowledge all the issues that emerge. Now, what this means is you ensure that you aren't narrowed in your sense of what the solution is. Uh, in other words, you've probably heard uh, what happens when you go to an engineer and you say, I want to cross this river. They say, hey, here's a design for the bridge. Or what you might say if you go to a boat builder, they go, this is the design for the boat. Um, so what we're really talking about when there's conflicts around how you create um, a solution or in fact even how you interpret a problem is the need to actually have a total 360 degree view of that problem and what the solution sets are. So declare is an extremely important step. Declare those dilemmas. Acknowledge the issues that come out, the current and the past issues. Now, frankly, you can't have a discussion on invasive species in Australia without talking about the cane toad, without talking about myxomatosis. No matter how annoying it is, you have to actually deal with it, and dealing with that gives you the basis upon which you can acknowledge the challenges about the science, science and the uncertainties related to science so that you can get some shared vision. 
If we've lost 2,000 species and our vision is to maintain biodiversity for the reasons that biodiversity are extremely important to society, which many people still don't completely comprehend as the basis for all of our ecosystems, then um, if we want those ecosystem services, we're going to need a vision where people can see how all of those things are linked up. And they're going to have to evaluate the progress towards that vision and that progress towards that vision has to be meaningful from their point of view, not just a scientific point of view. So let's think. Now, how do you, when you're thinking about the issues related to something like carp, um, which is currently the largest biomass in our rivers, how do you address this in a Dave kind of way? Our view would be that you would look at why carp has happened, how it impacts on our uh, rivers, but do it in a way that everyone can participate in so there is equal alignment in the public about the problem. Right now, we don't have that equal alignment. We have a plan for a solution, but not necessarily the alignment about what the problem is and how that problem could be solved. Um, so when we consider the steps towards getting to Dave, um, what we want to see is the accessibility to the dilemmas and the definition of a problem that actually brings all of the stakeholder groups into alignment around those. If you don't do that, what it triggers for people is immediate outrage. Now, outrage is a term that risk communicators developed about 50 years ago now because they knew that technical risks um, or hazards and outrage, the public intuition about risks, barely correlate. And due to the fact that they barely co correlate, correlate, I'm sorry, um, the, the scientific assessment of a risk is often not the same as the public assessment of the risk. Um, the emotional or the public intuition related to the risk is real, it can be measured, it can be predicted, and it can be managed. And when you manage it well, the real technical hazard of the issue stands out, and people can then start to talk about the solutions in a far less emotive way. So in this case, we did a bit of an analysis of what might be driving the outrage uh, related to CARP. And we found that there were probably four main drivers. Um, and the first is a loss of control. What happens when the herpes virus gets released in open body of water in terms of um, the impact on other species, the impact on human health when eaten, um, the loss of control of the virus in the system, the impact on ecosystems, uh, the impact of um, carp in terms of rivers um, when they die and what the impacts of those might be. Uh, and so there's a, a whole range of issues where control is an intuitive reaction uh, to the situation. So in other words, it's triggered. The question is, what would you do to assess that, mitigate that in your plans so that you can overcome the fears related to control? The second thing that gets triggered is the uncertainty. You know, there are scientific studies that say that this is and can be done safely. Um, in fact, in Indonesia it was, but in a far more um, secured environment than the river system. Whereas the UK has a view that it absolutely can't be done safely. And given that there is a variety of different scientific views, how do you bring certainty to those scientific views so that um, you can deal with that uncertainty effectively? If you don't, grab hold of the whole risk range, demonstrate to people that you have understood the breadth of uncertainty, then the assumption is or the intuitive trigger is that no one knows what they're talking about. So the concept of debating science from a public point of view is the worst possible um, outcome. What really matters is that as a scientist, if you stand up to talk about this expertise around understanding the uncertainties, the important thing is to be able to articulate the range of uncertainties and demonstrate you're across all of them and where the varying differences are and how they can be dealt with. 
The third element is trust. Uh, who's leading who here? And why are we doing this? In the end, it will be all the ministers that make a decision. And the question is, what is the risk reward for that decision? And how can we intuitively feel that we can trust that we will have all of the negative information provided to us? In other words, people will bend over backwards to provide that negative information because they want us to know all of the risks associated with this? Or is there a kind of, you know, positive story, you know, spin doctoring, covering up um, going on? And that, again, is intuitive. So does it feel like we know all of the negatives? If you look at what's going on at the moment, a lot of scientists are going to be doing studies, and those scientists are the ones that we're relying on to give us a trusted opinion. Today, that's insufficient because of the first, that point I made just before around how you deal with scientific uncertainty. And the fourth aspect is memorability. What's happened before? How can we acknowledge that? And what have we learned from that? And how do we do things differently today so that we don't have these kinds of problems in the future? What is fundamentally different? So if you grab hold of those four triggers of outrage and you said, we need to actually understand how to mitigate those and address them, then you're getting part of the way there uh, towards looking at the social licence issues. The next part is then doing what we call a social licence assessment um, around the maturity of the issues. So if you want to have a look at the academic background to this, it's on www.wikicurve.org. And this is an academic foresight tool that we created to look at the social maturity aspects of any issue. And we did one on the social maturity of viruses. So the concept of putting the herpes into a bacteriophage, that it can be a targeted uh, delivery vehicle to deal with CARP, is a very immature concept. And as a result of being immature, there isn't a huge body of academic rigour that you could go to and say, here is the body of evidence around the evolution of this thinking. And due to that, that immaturity, what the National CARP program is doing, which is really bringing together where the holes are and trying to sort that out, is a very valuable piece of work. So there will be a body of scientific rigour that, uh, that tries to deal with the CARP issue. And what it needs to do to get the public to be confident about it is grow the maturity of the public's understanding of this. Um, and you know, intuitively, the things like herpes um, being a very virulent um, uh, virus and also the concept of the super virus um, open bodies of water, all of these things are critical issues that the public would need to know and understand in order to have agreed, if you like, in order for there to be a social licence to say, yes, this is a solution that we think is appropriate. So that move from deciding, announcing and defending based on, hey, um, the river degradation caused by carp costs the economy $500 million a year. The consequences are significant, and this is the solution set, which is that first model we think has to be put away. It has to be set aside. The second model has to be considered. Declare those dilemmas. What are all of the issues? Let's have everybody agree with those issues. Demonstrate that we're having the science, maturing our ideas and understanding of it, that we can drive to a vision that we all agree to as a society and we can have the program put in place in a way that public can see and evaluate what the controls are, what the management program would be to deal with all of the mitigations required and to get us to an outcome we all want to see happen. Right, so to do that, um, one of the final elements that we think is critical to have in place is the mindset. The mindset of a um, culture in the, you know, posture, if you like, from we have a right to operate, where we are doing something that's good for the economy, it's good for science, it's good for the future, to one that's a social licence mindset, where we understand what the concerns and challenges are and we seek to address them and overcome them and bring people with us and close the knowledge gaps 
um, together, not use expertise in a way that dismisses people's concerns, but use expertise in a way that grabs hold of the risk range and resolves people's concerns. That shift, we think, is vital, and um, if you make that shift in terms of dealing with invasive species, we think there'll be a growing support for action and and a you know, co-ownership of the solutions, which is the basis upon which you can have partnerships and um, shared investments and genuinely acknowledging all the different sides of, of this will help people have a clear role around how they can play uh, a part in this vision. Thank you very much.